Welcome to the Competitive Edge. My name is Scott Britton and I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I get an edge in my business and life? Each week we're going to uncover how some of the most successful and inspiring entrepreneurs, entertainers, and thought leaders get an edge so you too can reach your full potential. Do you want more unique ideas and tactics like the ones we're about to share on this episode? Then you're going to want to do two things. The first is to subscribe to the Competitive Edge on iTunes so that you don't miss out on new ideas from future conversations. After this, you're going to want to go check out my main site, lifelonglearner.com. When you enter in your email address to join the Lifelong Learner community, you'll get access to my most advanced strategies to stack the deck in your favor. Again, that's life-longlearner.com. Dot com. Hey, hey, what is up, Competitive Eds listeners? I hope you're having an awesome day. As always, I appreciate you tuning in. Today, we have a good old-fashioned roommate special. My current roommate, Justin Maris, who is one of the most interesting and accomplished young studs I know, just released a new book called Traction Book with DuckDuckGo founder Gabe Weinberg. And today, I brought him on the show to discuss the theme of the book, which is how startups can acquire customers. This conversation was done at the old kitchen table of our apartment and covers some of the meatiest concepts in the book. And I think really just critical information for anybody out there looking to do a startup. Because you know one of the things we talked about is the reason that companies fail is not always because they can't build the product, but because they can't figure out how to get people to use it and how to get people at scale to use it. So we're going to talk about how you can do that and just some of the different ways you can test marketing channels, unconventional ways that other companies have been able to do this, even in the even in the face of saturated acquisition channels. Now, I think what really makes this an insanely valuable conversation is that a lot of times like when we're approaching things like getting new customers, you don't really have a framework for how to do things. Uh, that really simplifies like what we need to do as people that are trying to accomplish a specific goal that will make the process much easier. And so today we kind of unveil what that process is you can use to test different traction channels is, and we'll go over a lot of specific examples of how people have done this and how Justin has done this in some of his other companies. Justin's a rising star and amazing guy, which is why I wanted to live with him. And the knowledge in this interview is so valuable for anybody that's looking to up their game in marketing startups or building companies. I've said my intro piece. Let's go ahead and dive into this roomy special with Justin Maris. Justin, what is up, dude? How's it going, man? Good. Uh, welcome to the show, which today is occurring on the other side of our kitchen table here in Little Italy. That it is, with audio set up behind the mic and everything. Yeah, man. Uh, I kind of wish we were doing this video, but then again, we're shirtless, so probably <laughs> not the best thing. Um, Maybe not for you. Dude, come on. <laughs> Anyways, today we're going to talk about traction, dude. And like a lot of words in the startup scene, pivot. You know, all these all these words, these buzzwords we hear, a lot of times we actually don't even know what the heck it really means. So before we kind of dive into a lot of the cool stuff that you have in your book, um, let's just first define traction. And why don't you just give everybody a little insight that what you think of when you hear that word? Sure. So traction is essentially meaningful movement on a metric that your company cares about. So that sounds kind of general and not super helpful, but if you think about it, like traction is a meaningful improvement in something that is going to determine the success or failure of your company. Like if you are running a company and your goal is revenue, like you're trying to hit a certain revenue target before you hit break even or, you know, become raise your next round, whatever it is, then getting traction means making more money, like making more revenue. If you're trying to like get to a million users for some social app or consumer app thing, like traction for you might not be hitting a revenue goal, but instead hitting like a growth rate in users per week or hitting 10,000 users, 100,000 users, whatever it is. A zillion subscribers on a podcast. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let's let me, there yet? Let me get in there. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, um, so like what's a, what's a specific traction goal in a company that you've been involved with and or seen just so people can get like super clear on this? Sure, so for us, 
Uh, so I was director of revenue at a SaaS company called Airbrake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we we basically were a SaaS company, developer tools, and one of our big metrics was six figures in revenue per month. So like six figures in MRR, which puts us around one point two million dollars in annual revenue. Which then means like it opens up a bunch of things. Like you have tons of acquisition potential. You have a certain benchmark, and so like that was the number that we were looking at and made every decision through the lens of like trying to hit that number. Yeah, and I think this is so important because so you know as you know I was just down in Austin hanging out with Noah, and they have the similar mindset of like singular focus around a specific goal. Yeah, and their goal um, is they want to get sumo me to a billion page views, right? Which sounds insane, but according to the sweet little timer ticker ticker they have in their office, they're getting there. Um, and you know, one of the things he said to me, he was like, Scott, you're, you're doing like a freaking zillion things. Like you got your podcast, you're like trying to get a new company off the ground. You're doing like courses, you have clients, you have all these things like, dude, you need to like simplify and just create one goal. Yeah. And what that's going to do is allow you to make efficient decisions because right now you're just basing your decisions on like all of these things. But if you don't first establish like a clear cut goal, yeah. you don't know how to prioritize. Yeah. I mean, dude, it's tough and it's even harder at a company. Like if you think, so, you know, I was responsible for running marketing and if you don't have a clear vision and like a clear number that you're trying to hit, then any new blog post you read on Hacker News, something you see on growthhackers.com where it's like, do this little thing to like double your page views. It's like for Airbrake, like that was meaningless, you know, like unless that turned into money, that was just not worth spending my time on. And so it was really, really easy to kind of clarify it and figure out what we needed to focus time on because we knew the goal that we were trying to achieve. Got it. So is that the first step is establishing a goal? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And how should, how should we think about determining our goal? Yeah. So one, so this is a hard question to answer just because it is very company dependent. Like I said earlier, like revenue goals are not going to be right for a lot of app companies. Uh, you know, hitting 10 million users is totally unrealistic for even a company like Salesforce probably doesn't have 10 million users and they're like publicly traded billions of dollars market right. cap. You know, so it just is very, it depends on the company. So what I would do is if you're in the early stages of starting a company or you're running one, kind of look at a company that's ahead of you, maybe like one to two years and roughly get a sense of like where they are in terms of traction and then set that as like, you know, break that out into like a six month traction goal, a three month traction goal, a year long traction goal, you know? And so if you were starting a company now, uh, let's say a SaaS tool, like getting to, you know, ten thousand dollars in MRR in six months might be a really, really good goal for you. Can we just because not everybody's like developer SaaS tool, uh, <laughs> kid like you, MRR means monthly recurring revenue, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's sorry. So that's the amount of revenue you're making. Some of us are mere mortals here, <laughs> uh, so you know if you use vocabulary that's in the line, with that, that'd be great. Cool, cool. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Cool. So first step, <clears throat> establish what their goal is. Given your business goals, and I, you know, I think I hate to jump ahead right now, and I hate to talk about this, um, but you know, one of the things I overheard you talking about yesterday at the Padres game with Ryan was, and you just meant you alluded to this earlier, uh, and a lot of people, for better or for worse, start companies for this reason is an acquisition, right? Yeah. A uh, company gets bought out by a bigger company. Founders make a lot of money. Uh, yeah do cool stuff like move to Brazil with their buds. <laughs> but start a podcast. <laughs> come on. Um, but the, you know, like, is that million dollar, like for a SaaS company, which I know you've experienced in is a million dollar annual re recurring revenue. Is that like a magic number that opens up doors? Totally. Yeah. Okay. That's the number. I, absolutely. Yeah. Cause I mean, think of it from a company perspective, like there are probably a thousand, maybe low thousands SaaS, uh, software as a service companies that have a million dollars in annual revenue. And there are probably 10,000 side projects that are making several hundred to several thousand dollars a month. And like, if you're a company, so, you know, big companies make acquisitions. If you're a company, you may see a side project run by a developer that has 
you know, or anyone that has like 10,000 users is doing like 10 grand a month or something, but it's just not worth your time to like do due diligence, get team buy-in, write them a check, bring them into their team, like bring them into your team, incorporate them into your business and do all of this like M&A work for what is essentially a blip on your revenue radar. Like if you're a big company with an M&A department, you're doing tens, multiple tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And so acquiring like a company that's doing six figures a year is like literally a point of 1%, you know, like it's not even worth focusing time on. Got it. And, you know, just, just so we can kind of extrapolate this conversation further for people that are less familiar, typically when, let's say your revenue is a million, uh, depending upon like how much strategic value your company has, a whole lot of other factors. Yeah. You're looking at like seven to 10 X as an, as a typical acquisition, correct? Yeah. In SaaS. Yeah. In SaaS. So, I mean, e-commerce is closer to like two to three X multiple, but re uh, revenue multiple. But SaaS, the multiples are really, really good right now. Also, and you also have companies, you know, like Instagram, where you're a billion X. Yeah. <laughs> a billion X. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Multiple. But I mean, if, it's funny though. If you look at that now, like that acquisition makes sense in the scope of what Facebook was doing. Like they, everyone was flipping out when they bought Instagram, but they bought them when they had 30 million users. They're now over a hundred million. Facebook paid 1% of their market cap. Instagram is probably now worth like, Five billion, ten billion. So like, it was a good investment, although insane. You know, because there's no revenue target to like base the acquisition off of. Right. And, you know, as we like to say around this apartment, toads my goats, <laughs> or just my goats, or my goats. Um, <laughs> so that's cool, man. Okay, awesome. So glad we got to cover that. Let's let's talk about the next step. You establish your traction goal, mm -hmm. and at that point, what happens next? Yeah. So. I want to real quick, if it's cool, make an analogy for you, dude, anything. <laughs> I want to make like a, a fitness analogy. So I think if you were looking to get bigger, like get in better shape, do whatever. If you were just to say like, I'm going to get in better shape. If you didn't set a goal towards like number of lifts you want to do number like weight, you want to move around certain number of pounds you want to lose. Then there's so the fitness space is so broad that there are so many things you can play around with and test that don't meaningfully like get you anywhere. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you think like there's an infinite circle of things around you that you can do, if you're just like stabbing out in any direction, like you're not moving anywhere. You're just staying in the same circle. Whereas if you have a goal, you can very clearly say like, here are the things that I'm going to do that get me closer to this goal. Got it. So like, okay, I'm going to, and you should think about traction reverse, the same way. reverse engineer. Like exactly. I, I want to acquire a girlfriend. Then I have to have <laughs> a, a, a rippled six pack <laughs> ripping off of it. And then I have to go to the gym, try three times a week yeah, and do, you know, muscle triplicator bars after working out <laughs> to get the results. Got it. Totally makes sense. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, okay. Got it. That I like that framework. I think it's really powerful because it kind of like puts in our minds, like this idea that like, Wow, it really is backwards if we're not taking this approach with like clear goal setting. Um, yeah, and you know we can't just like eventually expect to get the results that we want efficiently if we're yeah. just showing up and just doing random things. Not at all, especially when so many blogs out there that you'll read will just say like random marketing tactic X. You know, it's like you need a lens or a filter through which to say like this doesn't apply to me, this does apply to me, or this is just like totally stupid. Got it. Okay, awesome. So you know, I know you talk about. Uh, this kind of like bullseye framework of figuring out which traction channel is most effective for your company. Let's dive into that. And then let's also just talk about, you know, some of the things that you've learned from interviewing over 40 successful founders on how they got traction. Sure. So bullseye to start with is a framework that we're introducing and that we discovered through our talks with like 40 founders who have sold, had successful exits, are building big companies and just doing really cool things in general. And so what we found is that companies that succeed now are approaching traction in the same way that companies approach product development. Like if you talk to a founder or a product manager and we're like, hey, what's on your product roadmap? And they didn't know. And they were just like, oh, we're gonna like test some things and see what happens. You'd be like, wow, this company is going to crash and burn. Like they have no idea where they're going. 
they don't really have a sense for like what might work, what won't, and what the customers want. Yet, if you talk to a lot of people in marketing, that's pretty much the approach they have. They're just like, we're gonna test a bunch of stuff and there's no framework, there's no thinking that informs like what they test. And so what the bullseye framework is, is it, it is a tool that founders and marketers can use to hone in and think about and then hone in the marketing channels that will make sense for their business, given the stage, given the type of business they're running, and given like the type of person they're trying to reach. Got it. Okay, let's let's extrapolate this. So let's give a real life example for people out there that are listening, maybe they're early nascent stages of starting a company. Okay, let's just say that Scott's Scott starts a software as a service company called Awesome Software. And right now I like say, you know what? First goal is I want to hit five thousand dollars a re- monthly recurring revenue um, on this tool, and I'm going to go ahead and use the bullseye framework to figure out how to get those new customers. Awesome. What is the first thing I should do, and like how should I begin the testing process? Sure. So essentially, so you have your traction goal, you have an idea of where you're going, and then what you would do is you look at all of the potential channels that you could use to get to $5,000 MRR. And so the bullseye, so this is why it's a bullseye. So this is why we called it the bullseye framework because there are 19 traction channels. There are 19 ways you can acquire customers essentially. And so the bullseye like zooms out and says, here are the 19 ways you could potentially acquire customers. And then we introduce a series of exercises. So basically you brainstorm, like what have competitors used to acquire company customers in this space? What does my marketing budget look like? Like, can I afford to acquire customer customers through channels that might be more expensive, like AdWords? If you're, for example, if your SaaS company was in, I don't, the insurance space or something, insurance, buying insurance keywords on AdWords is not six months. It's like $60 a click or something. And so if you don't have the marketing budget, if you're trying to bootstrap something, immediately what you can do is write off this channel. And so you can say, okay, AdWords will not make sense to me unless I raise a lot of money and you know maybe it becomes a channel I can look at down the line, it's not a good fit right now. And so what you do after u- using this exercise is you see what channels have worked for others in your space or other companies, uh, other SaaS companies essentially. So for a SaaS company, you'd probably arrive at some combination of like content marketing, outbound sales, and just general like networking, email marketing stuff. And so let's say you have those three channels and you're like, okay, here are some things that I think will work. How do I, how do I figure out what channel to focus on for this stage of the company? So now if you're just starting a company, you're, you know, so you're trying to get to $5,000 a month, then what that means is it's probably just you or maybe one other guy. You probably don't have a ton of like financial resources. So, you know, that probably eliminates like paid acquisition early on. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what that means is like, to me, I think that the first zero to five thousand, zero to ten thousand dollars in MRR is going to be hustle. So that'll be like networking, cold emailing, and like trying to get people who are in front of your audience, like to leverage them to get in front of their audience. So that might be like guest posting, doing uh, email marketing, like you know co email marketing or something. And so you have two or three of these things. And so now you can run a cheap test in each of these channels. Like you could do a, do two guest posts and then see how that worked. And then compare that to two weeks or a week of doing cold emails towards companies that you think would use awesome software, you know? And then what you have at the end of this process, after like three to four weeks, is you have an idea of what channel is going to best help you and help you most quickly achieve your goal of like $5,000 a month. Got it. Yeah. And I think... I think a really critical thing that we should make sure to bring up is that in order to know the efficacy of a channel, you have to have proper tracking in place, Mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, awesome, I'm going to go out and do this. And they can't measure properly across all channels, so they don't know what is the most effective way to quickly get to that acquisition number that they're interested in. Yeah. And so, you know, for you, like, do you have a process, do you have like almost like a checklist of things to do before you start testing the channels? Yeah, so that again is just really dependent on company stage. So 
at the awesome software stage of like zero to 5,000, I think that can just be literally spreadsheet tracking. Yep. Just like do a guest post, see how much, see how many signups you got from that guest post. Send out emails, see how many signups you got from those emails. At the later stages, when you're trying to balance like, how does AdWords compare with Facebook ads? How does Facebook ads compare with like retargeting or Twitter ads or something? That's when you need a more in-depth analytics tool, like a mix panel, kiss metrics, whatever. Got it. Cool. Makes sense. Now, when should people focus on traction? Because a lot of people out there, they build a product and they're like, sick, now I'm going to get customers. Yeah. Other people, they sell a product and they get customers before they've even built anything. Uh, I'm curious to hear from you as a traction expert, you know, when you think the appropriate time to focus on testing channels is. Yeah. So I will say the appropriate time is essentially right away. So I will say that if you look at the reason that startups fail now, fewer startups are failing just because like, oh yeah, we tried to do this startup and like we couldn't build the thing we were trying to build. Like awesome software and companies like it are very, very rarely failing because they can't build a software tool. Companies now are failing way more because they can't get traction. Like they can't get in front of enough users. They can't reach their benchmarks that they need to hit in order to raise their next round of funding, in order to be profitable, whatever it is. And so as more and more startups, like as the barrier to entry to starting a company gets lower, like you can be mildly technical, you can hire someone to build a software product for you. There's more information than ever about starting a company. Like more people are starting companies. And so that makes it a more competitive landscape. And so now what you're seeing is companies are not differentiating themselves as much on product and more on distribution, more on like how much traction they can get. And so if you think of that and if you believe in that, uh, which I do, you're seeing like Peter Thiel, Mark Andreessen, some of the smartest people in Silicon Valley are saying this. Uh, it means that you should start focusing on traction as soon as you can, because that ultimately in a competitive space is going to be what differentiates you totally. from others in it. Totally, and that's that, that excites me. Um, I think it, it should excite anybody who's into lead gen. Yeah, completely. Um, <laughs> and you know, what, you know what's interesting, man, is like, what I've realized is for most things, it is not the best product that wins. Um, if there's like a slight difference, differential yeah. marketing, like yeah, in a competitive market, totally, totally accurate. Totally. Like for example, somebody could have a 10% better product, yeah. but if somebody else has 80% of distribution in terms of like word of mouth, network effects, all the things totally. that come with that, that product's going to win. And that's why companies, no offense, like Salesforce that have that suck. Uh, are still market leaders because yeah. they've built a massive network, they have insane credibility, they have all these APIs that are now built into them yep. because they have distribution. So like for me, you know, the way that I actually think about it is like, yeah, obviously you want to build a bit uh, an amazing product, but like doubling down on like getting distribution as fast and efficiently as possible and cracking that code, like dude, that's the that's high leverage. Totally, man. Like I'm getting fired up right now thinking about it. <laughs> and actually you know, as we're both kind of in the nascent stages of starting new companies, um, for me, I actually think about getting distribution first. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's countless stories of people going from zero to hero on like the first like launching with distribution. And it, it just makes so many, so much sense to me for a lot of different types of products. Yeah. So like, let's go ahead and give a few examples of that. Um, because again, like, you know, it's not necessarily the best product that wins, it's the distribution. And a lot of times, like you said, it's not the business, it's not the product that's gonna drive the business, it's the distribution. Yeah. So like, I, I have an interview uh, that I did with Aubrey Marcus, founder of Onnit.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Onnit produces a supplement called Alpha Brain. It's a nutraceutical, it enhances your cognitive abilities. And that's an incredibly crowded space. But what Onnit, what Aubrey did is he partnered with Joe Rogan, uh, who is the founder of the Joe yeah. Rogan Podcast Experience. 10 million downloads a month, almost as many as a competitive edge. <laughs> Joking. But um, he launched with on Joe Rogan's podcast and yeah. sold out all of his orders in the first day and continues to sell out because 10 million people a month are hearing about 
his product. It can't grow totally. fast enough. And like what he did there is a process of securing distribution first and co-creating to get that person vested in the distribution. Yeah. Right. And like there's a zillion examples of this. I have a friend right now who just launched a face cream pro probiotic product that's doing that. I mean, there's countless examples of companies launching with distribution, even companies that build in to existing marketplaces, right? So we just both read Peter Thiel's new book. And instead of like trying to get all these, these uh, people using it, he went to a marketplace where people really are, like already were doing this thing yep. and just doubled down on the back of eBay with PayPal, right? He totally. targeted the power sellers, got the most influential power sellers on there right away, and then it spread like wildfire. Yeah. And you know, like they did a ton of other things like pay people to sign up for it. But yep. yeah, I just, I just like have, I think the distribution first mindset is so powerful because a, not only distribution is going to be taken care of, but also like you want to co-create with these people to create the best product, mm -hmm. right? Because the leaders in a space or people that are going to promote your product are going to enhance your ability to create it effectively. Totally. Um, so yeah, man, really like this mindset. I really like parallel traction focus with product creation. Yeah. I mean, if you think of the standard person starting a company and all the literature out there now is not like, it, no one talks about thinking about traction early on. Like it's much more like interview your customers, build an MVP, like all this stuff, which is good and works well. But if you're not focusing on traction, like it is so easy to build something for 10 customers and then find out that you can't scale, you know? Totally. And then your product just goes into the waste bin of like the hundreds of products started by people as side projects, as businesses that didn't work out, who essentially failed because they couldn't scale. Yeah. I mean, so that's kind of interesting because I know like one of the things that Paul Graham talks about is like do things that don't scale in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about traction, we think about evaluating these channels, how important is it for us to be focused on like, this might work now, but will this work for, it worked for 100 users, will this work for hundred getting to 100,000 users? Yeah, yeah. So to be honest, I'll, like one of the things that we cover in the book is how there are three different phases that your startup could be in. Like one is very much the early stage startup. Like when Paul Graham says, do things that don't scale, he's absolutely right. I mean, you're, the traction activities and the things you're going to do to get you from zero to $5,000 a month, like networking, you personally sending out cold emails, maybe going to meetups, like sponsoring a drink up. These are not things that will get you from 10,000 to a million dollars a month in revenue. But what they do is they can get you like your start. And then as you progress, you see these channels are less effective, you know, like at some point buying people beer and going to meetups, like no longer is meaningful in driving traction. They like driving users, getting revenue, whatever. And so what then happens is you shift where you start looking again, you know, we talk about using the bullseye framework to do this, but there's a shift. And at that point you start looking at like what channels can scale me from 5,000 a month to a hundred thousand a month. And that's when you start looking at like paid acquisition. You probably have some idea of, what a customer is worth to you, like what these channels cost to reach people through content marketing, maybe hiring like an inside sales guy. There, there are all these different things that you start to think about once you hit a certain point in your business. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, in the transition to that point, this idea of the law of shitty click throughs. Yeah. That Andrew Chan has popularized because a lot of people will say, okay, cool. Now I need to acquire customers at scale. I'm going to go on to AdWords. Yeah. And I'm going to start paying people and I'm going to create a machine. Yeah. And they realize that that's actually really hard to do. Yeah, completely. So let's kind of, you know, why don't you, why don't you tell people first what the law of shitty click throughs is? Yeah. So the law of shitty click throughs is this law. Andrew Chen coined it. He's a viral marketing expert. He runs a startup called Musi. Uh, they're a mobile app that's doing like tens of million, has tens of millions of users. Uh, they're doing really well, but he's just like brilliant viral marketing guy. And so the law of shitty, shitty click throughs is essentially this law that says any new marketing channel, be it AdWords or, you know, display ads in the early days has an initial period, kind of a romance period, if you think about it, where clicks are cheap, B 
because big brands and big, big advertising budgets have not shifted a lot of money onto these platforms. And you actually get much higher click through rates because uh, people on the internet are not blind to them. You know, like think of the last display ad you saw. It's probably hard to do because you just ignore all of them. Whereas in 2001 or 1999, when like the first display ads were coming out, those ads were getting like 60% click through rates. And now to give you an idea, they're getting like one one hundredth of a percent, you know? And so if you're trying to build a company on display ads now, much, much, much harder to do than it was in 1999. And so the law of shitty click-throughs is just that essentially any paid advertising channel, any advertising channel is, can be really, really effective in the early days. And then its performance just degrades as time goes on, as it becomes more crowded and as more marketing marketers and brands start using it. Got it. So then our job as marketers is to, from my perspective, is to do two things. And I'd love to hear your focus on that, your thoughts on this. But one, figure out how we can innovate on that particular platform to yep. get a higher ROI. Two, look for nascent platforms that have not been exploited yet, uh, where you might be able to get a competitive edge. Call yeah. them off. <laughs> um, so, I mean, is that kind of your thinking framework? And maybe we give some specific examples of totally people innovating on platforms. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. And so the only caveat I would say is that this only applies to early stage and cash strapped businesses. Like if you're insurance and you have a billion dollar marketing budget, like TV and AdWords is a super saturated channel. But you essentially don't give a shit, you know, because you have a billion dollars to spend on marketing. Right. Like, so that is the only thing. Like, if you are a small, scrappy startup looking to acquire customers in ways that better funded, better capitalized companies can't, that's when this law of shitty click throughs is critical to your success. Got it. So, that being said, yes, totally agree. So, one, you want to figure out. You know, what are these newer platforms and how can we maximize the ROI on these platforms? Secondly, you want to be on the lookout for newer platforms that are up and coming and that are not yet saturated with large brands. Who's somebody who's done an awesome job of innovating on what seemed to be a saturated platform and how they've approached acquisition? Yeah. So let's see. So, I mean, there are a lot of companies that uh, like eSurance has done a really, really good job on display advertising, actually. Like mm -hmm. their display and their paid advertising channels uh, up until their acquisition by Allstate, which was two or three years ago, they were doing really well getting uh, getting people to click on display banners. Like, What were they doing? So they had a bunch of TV commercials that they would put in local markets and then they would target those local markets with banner ads that like moved and you saw like the eSurance girl doing stuff. And those, because like they built brand awareness, they got really, really good clicks on some of those banners uh, that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So formula is, if we were to codify that, continuity between brand awareness and then displaying the scene to display ads online and putting hot girl on the email. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, so that worked for insurance. But otherwise, if you're, there are, so there are a lot of companies that have innovated on existing platforms like what's a good so instagram for example they have done a fantastic job of like growing by leveraging social media like they were all over twitter had a deep integration with facebook they had email invites and just all this stuff like snapchat lots of companies have grown through um, you know people's phone books like contacts in their phone mm -hmm. snapchat was one of the first that made that their sole distribution channel Super smart. Yeah. One, one of the ones that comes to mind, just probably because we're on a podcast right now, is, and this is again, this is more of like a technical integration, but still, like, how do you outperform others on existing channels? Is if I share an audio track on using a SoundCloud link, so I host my audio on SoundCloud and then I share it on Twitter, that person not only sees the expanded image associated with that track, yeah. they can play the music directly from the stream. Yeah. Right. There's a big play button and that I, I don't know the data, but I imagine like that click through is much higher than if it was just a static link. Totally. Without a picture, without a play button. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Amazon's testing stuff like this right now where you can add products to your cart from Amazon links that people tweet. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Hopefully there's lots of 63 life hacks books <laughs> or traction book that are being shared, um, <laughs> which I might figure out how I can have assistance do that. <laughs> but, um, let's, okay, cool. Now let's talk about like, I know an example of, uh, a nascent, somebody taking advantage of a nascent platform being like a first mover and then taking advantage of subsequent network effects that occurred be because of that growth of that platform. Yeah. But I'd love to hear maybe a new one from you that I don't know. So what's one that you're thinking of? Right I'm now? thinking of my friend's site greatest on Pinterest. Awesome. Okay. So there are two that I'll talk, talk about quickly. So one Zynga, they started advertising on Facebook and leveraged Facebook's viral and friend sharing stuff in the early days before clicks one before clicks were expensive on Facebook and two, when Facebook didn't have a lot of the permission stuff kind of like hammered out just yet. So I don't know if you remember being on Facebook, but this was four years ago, maybe five years ago. Uh, you would see a ton of invites from your friends to play like mafia wars and mob boss and farm bill. I had this aunt that I'm like, I swear to God, there's nothing else that you do <laughs> but go on Facebook, find new games, yeah. and fight me. Like, yeah. I don't want to be one of your mob homies. <laughs> exactly. And, like, I don't want to sell you a donkey. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so what that was, it, and the reason you don't see that anymore, is because Zynga leveraged the hell out of that, that ability and that Facebook platform, and they can no longer do that. No company now can leverage Facebook in the same way that Zynga was. Like, you can no longer have someone sign in to a game using Facebook and invite spam all of their friends. Like, it's not possible. And so what that means is if you're starting a social game today, you have a much harder go of it, or you have to look at different acquisition channels than Zynga did when they were starting. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess if, I guess if we were trying to like codify how somebody might be able to do this, is out there is like, look at all the existing platforms, look at the new platforms. Yeah. Uh, and then, totally. and then again, is it, is the idea there to run a test on these new platforms? Absolutely. So if you think about, yeah, so I mean, so basically you want to look for a new platform that has people that you want to target on that platform or that you could potentially see them using it, you know, and then you want to just run a test there. Like, the, the, the amazing thing about targeting new platforms is that as that platform grows, if you're one of the early movers there, naturally you will just have something that snowballs on top of that platform and you'll just get more and more, you know, like the platform is incentivized to push their top right. users as they grow. Exactly. And you know, if people want a, a more like deep dive into that, uh, I check out, I suggest checking out my uh, podcast episode with Derek Flonsrek from Greatest. He was one of the first guys that was focused on Pinterest. Yeah. And I think Pinterest today, they have over 4.5 million uniques a month and Pinterest acquire, Pinterest is responsible for at least 40% of that, maybe even over 50%. And the reason was, you know, he was one of the few people that was really focused on optimizing Pinterest early. Yeah. But they're like, as it grows, you just get to take advantage of the network effects. Totally. Right? Because Pinterest is featuring you as one of their top places to go. 100%. On that site. Yeah. I mean, so can I uh, talk about a interview that we did for the book? Just Absolutely quickly? not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. About interview the so one of the guys that we interviewed was a co-founder of Evernote. And so Evernote, for those that don't know, is a note-taking app, makes it easy to take notes. You can access it on your phone, online, whatever. So they have a model where they don't charge for it. So there's like a 0 0.1, 0 0.5 or 0.6% of their users end up paying for it, which means that like they couldn't buy users essentially because they're, you know, there was no like revenue back end essentially. So what they did is they had the strategy of focusing on new platforms exclusively for their growth. Mm -hmm. So what that meant in practice is when they started, they were one of the first apps on the Apple iStore, uh, Apple App Store when the iPhone launched. Now, you, today you're thinking like, wow, that's insane. Like that must have been such a huge windfall. But at the time that was actually kind of risky. Like lots of people didn't think the iPhone would work. Apple was kind of like a company on the downswing. Um, but instead it paid off insanely well. Like they acquired millions of users through it. They got featured in the app store and they did all, they had all these amazing benefits. On the flip side, 
they have applied the strategy to platforms and they did the same thing with like the Windows 7 phone, which totally flopped. But you can see like if that if the Windows 7 phone had worked, that would have been millions more users for them, you know, but it didn't. And so like average out, they still acquired millions of users building shit for like two platforms. Right. You know, and so like that is just the core of their marketing strategy. They did it with uh, Chrome extensions, with Firefox add ons, with all of these different things where they could acquire users that the platform had an interest in like pushing, you know, like pushing their app to their users. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, it's very, honestly, it's very similar to, you know, some of the things that I've done with things I've created. So yeah, you're a good marketer. So like Amazon, figure out how you get featured on the platform, yep. ride the shoulders in that iTunes, figure out how the algorithm works reverse engineer success. Totally. Udemy, reverse engineer success. And just ride on the shoulders of people that are incentivized to promote you. Totally. I mean, it's just a, it's a winning, game-changing strategy that you can apply to a ton of different things. They're trying to go a software product totally. through like an app store, right? So like think about the Salesforce app store or like, yeah. I know Constant Contact, App Connect. Be the first thing that people yeah. see when they sign on to that. Yeah. Make that the only thing you do, and like, y you don't have to build a ten thousand person email list through blogging. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it, it comes with platform risk for sure. Totally. Like, think of how many you know social media things have collapsed and not worked out, like Twitter has. But if you're the first person, if you're like one of the first people on Twitter, you have millions of followers right now. Yeah. You know, and that's just that's not a function of how good you are. That's not a function of like how hilarious your tweets are. It's just a function of you being super early to a platform that grew exponentially. Right. So at this point, everybody should stop what they're doing and go sign up for every single app <laughs> and potentially be rich off it. No, I'm just kidding. But well, I'm curious, you know, is there a platform out, right? Is there one to however many platforms out there that you're, you think are an interesting thing for companies to be looking at as potentially... Absolutely. Early, early movers. Yeah, absolutely. So one of them in the content marketing game, blogging is incredibly crowded. And so what I, if I were starting a B2B company or like any company that was looking at content marketing as a channel, I would look at leveraging Medium or LinkedIn publishing, both of which are relatively new platforms, not super saturated yet, to distribute content and collect email addresses, like get my name out there. You know, because like, if you looked at LinkedIn publishing, I think there's 2000 people publishing stuff. Now, if you think of content marketing, there's like 125 million blog posts published every day. And so which one do you think you're going to stand out more? You know, which one do you think you have a better chance of figuring out what works? Right. My guess is LinkedIn. Right. And LinkedIn is incentivized to promote good stuff on their publishing platform because they want more people. Totally. Yeah. I mean, that's, I would do the same exact thing. And honestly, you know, our friend, or I guess, I don't know, we're not buds yet, but we will be. I, I'm kind of buzzing. Greg Ciotti, I know you read his blog too. Yeah, um, we're, we're emailed online. a couple we're, times. We're online buds. Um, yeah, yeah. Max met in person. <laughs> um, but like, I know he did a, an experiment where he just published old blog posts on LinkedIn publishing and got hundreds of thousands of views. Yeah. Like this was not even creating new content. Our yeah. friend James Clear uh, did the same thing where he republished old content on Quora blog posts. Totally. And subsequently got those got found and resyndicated on big sites like Forbes, Business Insider, wherever. And yeah, I, I totally agree. And you know what, how I would think about this if I'm thinking about LinkedIn, Quora, whatever it is. Look at the blog posts that are at the the, the first thing that you sign up on the top. Yep. See what's getting featured. Work backwards to see like how much it takes to get on there, and then do whatever it takes to get on that front page. Yeah, right? because because the line share goes to whoever gets featured or whoever's number one. Completely. And I mean that's 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 the high level game plan. Yeah, I mean if you, so if you read Greg's post on his LinkedIn publishing experiment, he got two hundred eighty thousand views of his post or something like that in I think it was a month maybe two months. Mm -hmm. That is like a very very respectable blog. Like for that a year. Yeah. <laughs> like that is probably what someone like a Neil Patel might get in a month. Like he got by leveraging LinkedIn, which is insane to think about. 
that's probably more than Tim Ferriss's blog was getting five years ago. Totally. Totally, man. I mean, it's... I mean, you're relatively well-known, and that's like... That's more than I get. Sizably bigger than what you get in a month. So, straight up, I get like twenty to 30,000 uniques a month. Yeah. So, uh-huh. he got almost 10x by doing this in a month. You've been doing this for three years and are relatively well-known. Like, people are listening to your podcast. People know who you are. Love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas this dude, like, Greg didn't... He's not really well-known. And he got 300,000 views in a month. Yeah. It's so powerful, man. It's so powerful. Like, yeah. I mean, I even look at like the top podcasts, like other people out there, like, you know, John Lee Dumas was the first guy, I think really, he has a podcast entrepreneur on fire to realize that Apple ranked you in their store for organic discovery based upon the number of downloads in a short period of time. Well, what's the easiest way to get them more downloads? Guess what? It's to publish more episodes. So you do five a week. And then what happened was, is he kept doing that and then got featured at the top of the store. And then because he's at the top of the store, all of a sudden now he gets organic downloads. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. He's done an amazing job being a consistent at that. But it's just an example of somebody figuring out the formula and then taking advantage of it before it became too saturated. Totally, man. Yeah. We have case studies like this in the book. Uh, this one, especially of Train Yard, that they released an app. It was a game app. And they basically figured out how to game the platform in other countries to then get featured in the US. And like their traffic graph is ridiculous. Like how many downloads they got. I think it went up like 3000 X in three days. Wow. Because of this. Yeah. Like that's insane. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I thought one of the fun traction channels that we could talk about, and I don't know if it's necessarily the most effective channel um, because I've had some pretty big media coverage myself and it's done absolutely nothing yep. for me. Um, but it's still fun to talk about is I know you have a section in the book, unconventional public relations yep. or public relations and then unconventional public relations. And there's gotta be some cool stories that you yeah. heard. And I'd love to just hear one or two of those to get people thinking, because for me, like the biggest joy of marketing and I'm sure you feel the same way is there's just so much creativity here. Totally. Right? And totally. like, the world is your oyster in terms of what you can try to figure out what works. Yeah. And so this is one of those things. So unconventional PR, as we call it in the book, consists of like media stunts, different stunts, uh, doing things for your customers. Like think of Zappos as a really good case study of this, who just like customer loyalty and does things to surprise and delight their customers. And they've gotten a ton of good word of mouth from that. So one example from the book is, have you heard of Grasshopper? Yeah. Yeah. So Grasshopper is like a digital phone service for t- targeted towards entrepreneurs and businesses. And so it's like basically what it is, is if you're not a big company, but you want to sound like a big company, yeah, it gives you like a phone number and I'll call it like, hi, you've reached uh, the competitive edge podcast and press yeah. one for whatever. And Stacey. like, you know, it's just me with my cell phone in my apartment in San Diego, but yeah, it makes yeah. Me sound like I'm a big deal. Totally. Yeah. So what they did is when they launched, they took a look and they were like, okay, channels are really crowded. Like, we're not going to get PR because what news agency is going to cover like new cell service launching today, targeted entrepreneurs, like, man, boring, you know? And so what they did is they sent out, I think it was like 200 chocolate covered grasshoppers along with the press kit to a bunch of media outlets, influencers. And then they attached a link to a video that they did called entrepreneurs can change the world. And so what this did is it was this really nice media package. You open it up. You see a chocolate grasshopper, like, okay, what is this? Mm -hmm. You go online, you look at the video and it's this whole thing promoting entrepreneurship as a way to change the culture, like a way to make an impact. And so what they did is through this stunt, they were able to build a story of like, we are a company that supports entrepreneurs and then tie themselves into that story. And through that, they got coverage from like 50 media outlets. They got, I think, 700,000 views on like, there are different properties like YouTube, you know, all of this. And then they got like thousands of customers from that. And this was their launch. Like within a month of the company being live, they had thousands of customers from this launch, like the stunt that they did, which is just huge. Wow. That's awesome. I love that. Conversely though, I mean, as you know, I'm sure there's a lot of instances where people tried to do that and nothing happened. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's like everything then, you know, like marketing is 
not like a binary thing. It's not like, yes, I'm marketing. No, I'm not. It's like, you're just trying shit, hoping that some of it works. And what traction book and like what smart marketers do is they just think more intelligently about what might work and what won't like in your recent post about uh, marketing your podcast, there were things in there that you did that you spent meaningful time on that did absolutely nothing. But like the problem is you just didn't know what those would be before. Right. You know? Right. I think that's, that's just like a broader lesson. I mean, I talk to this when I teach people like lead generation through cold emails um, mm-hmm. that like, listen, there is no like guaranteed silver bullet that every single time you use this, it's going to work. All we're giving you is tools to make the process of figuring out what to work easier yeah. that you can try and test yourself and and then iterate based upon the results you get. Totally. And I think that's exactly what you're delivering here with Traction Book is like, here's a proven toolkit. We've gotten this information from 40 of the most successful entrepreneurs and your job is to basically use this framework, use these tools and figure out what works. Yeah. But like we're not going to like hand deliver you the customers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, unfortunately or for, or fortunately, there are very few things you can do where it's like you turn it on and a stream of customers just come flocking to your door, you know? Like it's making money is hard. This is why tons of startups fail. This is why there are not like tons of millionaires. Like not everyone who starts a company is super successful. Like it's just hard. And so what is effective is approaching this difficult task of like getting a company off the ground, getting customers, and using a framework that helps you think about what will work best to acquire customers. I love it, man. I, I absolutely love it. I think it's so valuable. And honestly, like I'm gonna be using the worksheet that's included in the book. Awesome. Uh, for my own traction development. And you pre-ordered it too, I see. Uh, Avi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, because I just think it's really cool, I love hustle. Like that's for me, just some of the most, not only interesting stories, but just, I think it talks a lot about the type of person that somebody is. Mm -hmm. Um, Talk a little bit about how you got this opportunity to write this book with Gabe (laughs) and give a little bit of background here because a lot of people I think could benefit from learning this, what you did, learning about this and potentially even emulating it for their own lives. Yeah, sure. So at the time I was, I was a senior in college. So I was walking to class one day and being like kind of a nerd, I was listening to a mixer interview with my now co-author, Gabriel Weinberg. Uh, he sold a company in the past for like 10 million bucks, sold a founder, didn't raise any money. Uh, and then now he's working on a company called DuckDuckGo, which is a privacy based search engine. Uh, who's doing like 150 million searches a month or something. They're like doing really, really well. So very influential, smart guy. He was on the Mixergy podcast. And so Andrew Warner runs Mixergy. He interviews successful entrepreneurs and other people starting businesses. And I was just listening and like at the end of the interview, Andrew was like, so Gabe, I hear that you're working on this book. Like I hear that you're the traction guy. Like you've interviewed a couple entrepreneurs about how they've gotten traction, but you know, what, like, what have you learned from this? And Gabe essentially said, yeah, no, it's an awesome project. I really want to dig into why startups do or don't get traction, but I don't have time anymore. Like my startup is doing really well. I'm a solo founder. Like I just can't write a book and start a massively important company at the same time. And so senior in college, Uh, I was running my own startup at the time and I just sent Gabe a cold email. I was like, Hey man, I have a blog that you can, you know, gets no traffic, but you can see that I can like put words together in a way that makes sense. And I was like, I will come on and write this book for you if we can partner up and I will do the interviews. Like I'll flesh this out. We can make this, this amazing project. You'll get to launch it without putting in as much time as you would need to. I'll do a lot of the grunt work because I'm not as important. My time's not as valuable right now being like 22 years old and, you know, you know, in college. Uh, and so I basically pitched him on doing this. And after a couple back and forth, he was like, dude, let's do it. I'm excited. And that's how we started writing traction book. That's amazing. And, you know, I think like what I've uh, kind of characterized 
these situations is as like hustle windows Mm -hmm. where essentially like you have an opportunity to create value for yourself or your company by just like putting yourself out there and exposing or taking advantage of an opportunity. Yeah. And like you saw one, you took massive action, you emailed Gabe, you put yourself out there, everything to gain, nothing to lose. Yeah. You did it, dude. Totally. And, uh, it's awesome. It's really, really awesome. And, you know, just to kind of give a little further hint of inspiration here, besides launching this book, like talk about some of the cool things that have happened because in that moment of decision where you're like, I'm going to email this guy who doesn't know me, <laughs> who's a big deal, whatever it is, I'm going to yeah. email and I'm ask him, you decided to say yes. And that's a lot of things that a lot of people cower away from. What are some of the things that have happened to you because of that decision to say yes? Oh man. So, so much. I mean, so first of all, my first interview for Traction Book was with Noah Kagan. That was the first time I talked to Noah. Noah! Yeah. That was the first time I talked to Noah. From that conversation, he offered me a job to like help AppSumo create courses. So I pulled together their mint marketing course, which was like their best selling course. I got paid as a consultant, got to know Noah, got to see like how AppSumo worked. It was just like an incredible learning experience. And I made some money, so that was cool. And then after that, like I interviewed a bunch of people that when I moved to San Francisco a year later, I knew a bunch of people. Like I had talked to them, I'd interviewed them, I kept in touch with them, and I've gotten like multiple job offers from people that I interviewed, which is not what I'm looking for. Like I'm starting my own company, but still it's really, really cool. You know, like it, it's given me a ton of options. And now I'm launching this book at 24 years old. And I think it will have a massive impact on how startups think about marketing. And if I'm the guy that wrote that book, like that is just going to be insanely valuable to have done in 24, you know? Yeah. For you and your roommates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, that's, it's so amazing and inspiring and awesome. And, you know, actually what I'm thinking about right now, and I'm just going to say it because people perhaps would find it interesting is Peter Thiel's idea that the best salesmen are never selling. Um, and right now I was just thinking about like in my head, like what opportunity can I just create an open loop for somebody interesting out there listening to potentially take advantage of. Um, but I like that. I don't necessarily have one at this moment. Yes, you do. Anyone who gets over a hundred emails a day. Yeah, actually. Yeah. You know what? If you get over a hundred emails a day and you hate email, hit me up. Um, or you think that's an interesting problem. Uh, so yeah, man, I mean, this is, uh, this has been so cool and really, motivating for me and inspiring. I feel like I had five shots of espresso. Um, <laughs> but if people want to know more about people want to pick up traction book, where's the best place to go. And then I also want to make sure that people know where to find you because you're an awesome dude. Uh, thanks man. Who I enjoy following as well. Yeah. So to find out more about traction book, go to tractionbook.com. Uh, you'll see pre-orders. You can get our email list. If you're not ready, we'll send you the first couple chapters for free. Otherwise, you can find me. I'm on my blog, justinmares.com. Uh, and yeah, would love to like hear from anyone who has found this useful at all. Sweet. Thanks for coming on, man. Been a pleasure. Dude, thanks for having me. Before we finish up with today's Mindshare, I just want to say thanks for listening to another episode of The Competitive Edge. If you enjoyed the ideas in this episode and want access to future conversations, the best thing you can do is subscribe to the competitive edge on iTunes. If you haven't done that already, right now is the best time to take care of that and get on board. And while you're there, if you feel like this show has made a positive impact on your day, it'd be great if you could leave us an iTunes review so that more people can find the show. Now, I know we covered a lot in this episode and there might be a few key ideas or tools that you want to remember. So we went ahead and compiled all the notes and links mentioned from this conversation for you on lifelonglearner.com. That's life-longlearner.com. Alrighty, let's go ahead and dive into today's Mindshare. Okay. 
Okay, time for a Mindshare segment. And today, you know, as I had my roommate on the show, Justin, um, I thought maybe I'd talk a little bit about, you know, one of the ways that I think about uh, who I should live with and who maybe you should live with if you're maybe somebody who doesn't have a family and a wife and kids already, uh, and should probably live with them. But as a young person, uh, I actually think that, you know, roommates, it can be an incredibly valuable opportunity to really design an environment that pushes you towards your goals uh, and at the same time have a lot of fun. And for me, like one of the things that I'm very keenly aware of is that my expectations for myself are what determine what I'm going to accomplish and often in many cases, the quality of my life. And there's nothing that has a greater impact on your expectations of yourself than the expectations of your peer group. And of your peer group, odds are that you're probably going to spend the most amount of time with your coworkers and or whoever you live with. So for me, you know, this is like an incredibly intent thing that you have to be incredibly intentional about because it's going to dramatically affect ultimately like what you're able to accomplish and just potentially even the trajectory of your life. So, you know, I just wanted to say like, I feel really fortunate to live with Justin. One of the reasons why I wanted to live with him is because we're both focused on on kind of the similar mission right now of of starting a new company, determining what that new company is, um, and really like getting quote unquote traction for whatever we're working on. And this this whole process is insanely easier than if I was doing this by myself in a dark room. And you know we've even done things to build upon the mere fact of just the subconscious like accountability that exists by having somebody else who's out there achieving uh and what that may what that causes you to do and i thought this might be a cool opportunity to just describe like the system that we use to stay accountable to achieve progress that's really cool because it's with the person that i'm living with so every week on sunday we basically just like sit down lay out goals for the week and four to five goals and these range from goals that we have both in our personal lives to business goals we want to accomplish and at the end of each week uh, we review these goals and see if we were able to hit them. And this is like really, really valuable because, you know, when you're kind of in those nascent stages, like if you don't have anybody to be accountable to, then it's going to be way harder for you to do those things that are challenging or difficult that have some resistance. So like for me, this has been amazing because I want to maintain my accountability with Justin because I'm an integrous guy. And I, if I do, so, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to go do it. Um, so this system has been awesome for that. And it's gotten me to do things that have made me uncomfortable. It's gotten me to do things that I probably wouldn't have done if I didn't have somebody there to report to that I did or did not do them. And kind of a fun thing that we do is we put stakes on each week. So if I don't accomplish the goals um, that I set out for myself, I have to do something for Justin and vice versa. So I just give you an example of these. Um, you know, one of the stakes is I, I like dancing. Uh, so I want to take dancing lessons. So if Justin doesn't hit his goals, he has to pay for my dancing lessons. I've had to buy him a yoga pass, uh, pick up the tab at a cool restaurant, go to a Padres game. I had to buy him shoes, which was incredibly painful. And all these things have like a hundred dollar ceiling. Um, but like, I have to tell you, like a lot of times I wake up and I'm motivated to do something or to squeeze an extra time for something or push on something late at night because I don't want to buy my roommate's shoes. And it's so funny. Uh, that we're able to get leverage to like these like seemingly meaningless things. Um, but it, it truly is powerful. And again, I think, I think the stakes are part of it, but really what it is is, you know, our desire to just remain consistent with our identities. Um, and for me, like, you know, my identity part of that is just somebody who de- who does what he says he's going to do. Um, so I, it's very important for me to be consistent with these goals. So if you're listening out there, um, you know, and perhaps thinking about a new living situation, uh, think about, think about kind of the influence of your expectations for yourself and the expectation of your peers and that relationship there, as well as, uh, this accountability system. Um, perhaps like it's not for building a company, but per- perhaps it's for losing weight. Perhaps it's for being healthier and having a healthier diet, or maybe it's just like giving more attention to your partner or your girlfriend or whatever it is. All of these things can be enhanced uh, when the journey is not solo. And we just use a Google spreadsheet to, to make sure that we're doing these and to track these. Um, so 
think about that. Think about implementing it. It's been insanely valuable practice for me. And, uh, you know, I thank everybody for just tuning in today. Uh, I hope you found the interview valuable. And as always, if you have any comments or feedback, just hit me up on Twitter, hit me up in the Lifelong Learner Mindshare Facebook group. You can find that by just searching Mindshare. And I appreciate everybody's uh, tuning in today. I hope you have an awesome day. I'll see you on the next episode.